Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we're here to talk about how do ENTJs experience emotions? So yeah, I'll have you guys get started. Well, I'll just start out by saying this. If you're experiencing emotions as an ENTJ, uh, that's exactly where you don't want to be. Uh, I find when I'm emotional, then I'm starting to make bad decisions. And those bad decisions hurt me in the long run. So that's just not something I'm about to just be completely honest with you. Um, what I can use my FI in in a good spot is uh, in implementing a system that uh, brings my uh, morals uh, out um, and helps other people. So that's the way you kind of want to do that. And I took that from uh, Dario Nardi's Magic Diamond book. So yeah, that's what I think uh, ENTJ should be doing. And you'll see that later in life as ENTJs get older, they want to give back to society. But when they're younger, they're kind of ruthless and getting things done. But later in life, they they, they want to give back. So that's their FI coming out. Precisely, Mercer. And so you'll see two kinds of relationship with the inferior function. They'll either reject or hold on to very tightly for dear life. And how this shows up in an ENTJ is they either see emotions as irrational and makes them make bad decisions. They don't like that state. They feel out of control and they kind of see emotions as an excuse. Like there are some ENTJs who don't like crybabies because being a crybaby is almost like an excuse. So that's the rejecting of the feeling. And then there are also ENTJs that will hold on to their FI. So you, you call this set and forget. There are some ENTJs with really strong morals and very strong values. And then they set it and then they set their vision to accomplish that value. And so you have two extreme relationships with emotion you'll see in ENTJs, but also other manifestations as well. Anyone else want to elaborate? Uh, I'll jump in. I know that my emotions are extremely strong. I have a lot of passion and a huge amount of inner fire. And if I don't take the time to process that when it initially comes up of how I feel in the moment, I can burn the whole village down, right? <laughs> Let's be honest. It's, it's a lot of fire. And, and if that inner fire from inside goes out like, like a dragon, that would not be advantageous for anybody. So I've learned over my, and including myself, because I don't want to burn bridges. I don't want to burn villages, obviously. And I need to take the time, allow myself the time and space to process what I'm, what might be coming up and what are the layers of those feelings and the, the seed or where did it, where did it actually come from? What's the root? And when I can get to the root of where all those other feelings came from and each layer at a time, then I could clearly communicate that in a super healthy way with the people around me. And that has the outcome that I want to see that everybody feels seen and heard. And we get to that result that, that everybody is in unison about. And I've, that's, that's been really powerful for me to take the time. And when I say that to people that I, that are in my life, that are my loved ones, they're like, thank you. Thank God. Like, thank you for taking that time <laughs> because they know what the result might be. If I just reacted, uh, like Mercer said, if, I react, if I came from a place of being reactionary instead of responsive, that's what I aim. I think that there's always a space between reaction and responding that we can take that quiet time to process how we feel about it. That makes a lot of sense. I'm just thinking about how, you know, you ENTJs describe that you can be impatient at some times. So I wonder if, if you have a lot of pent up emotion, maybe frustration or anger and plus impatience, if that accidentally seeps out, it can be like a volcano at a certain moment. Yeah, I would say definitely. Um, was exactly to your point, Joyce. Um, for me, the way that it kind of shows up, it's the same way like Addison shows. Like, I think it, when I become emotional and I've, I've let somebody into that space or I felt a particular strong way about something, I can get kind of cold and ruthless and I don't like being like that because I'll get angry and I'll get frustrated. And so that um, that part of me that it, it takes away from that TE thing, where it's just kind of like, I, if I hadn't did this in the first place, this would have never happened, you know. So a lot of the times, um, 
I, I can love hard on something when I do. And then when I feel like I get disappointed, I'm like, I should have never did it in the first place. So that's why I kind of, you kind of bottle it and you're like, yep, I'm never doing this again. Screw that. I knew what I said was right the first time. And so we learn, is the NTJ, we learn from that. We go, okay, this was the past experience I had with this. It's going to be no differently going forward. Because when we do, we do love hard. Like I always say, like, the hardest day of my life would be when my grandmother passes because that was my mother. That was the first close, genuine relationship we've had. And I've heard a lot of NTJs say that they um, they have a thing about being, you know, when they get to the F, I think that's the reason why we're attracted to more like INFPs or ISFPs, any introverted feeling dominant, because they live with genuineness. So it's just kind of like, all right, just kind of be yourself. You don't have to use that intelligent left side brain external to you thing. So, um, and I also have trouble. I also had a tr- lot of trouble when I do get into FMO of letting go people in certain situations. So like, I'll, I know the logical side would be like, well, you know, this, that, and this side. But then it's like in the heart wise, I'm like, ah, like I shouldn't have did that. So it's it's a lot more painful to an ENTJ to have to deal with certain things because we know that the logical side should have told us nothing to do with that. So I think I it got me in trouble a lot when I was younger too because I never used to open up how I feel. Like, and it's the problem, still a problem to this day as an adult. But people were always like, how you feeling? How you doing? And I'm like, what does that mean? It don't even matter. It's gonna sound like I'm complaining. So it doesn't even matter what I'm saying. So I think um we it it we don't wanna even waste time trying to give that away because to us that's where the the gem is at, so so to speak. That's such an interesting statement. There's that negative connotation around feeling again. I'll say this is uh also with um FI on um, being in inferior spot. Um this is just something I just noticed about myself because I objectively look at myself. Uh, when morals come into play and there's something to do with getting things done, now I got a dilemma there, okay? Uh, that's where things really start to be as in like someone who's an INFP or ISFP, they're going to go with their morals. And I'm like, yo, that might take me six years to do it that way. But if I just say, screw my morals in this moment, I just get this done. I get this done in a year, six months, eight months, and I'm done with it, you know? So um, I know kind of deep down that don't put me in a spot where I got to make a moral decision. Just please don't. Just please don't put me there. Like, it's, you know, I'm just going to take the best move on the board. You know, unfortunately, it may not be the most moral decision all the time, but that's just, that's just how it's going to go. I, you know, I just have to be honest with people. I'm not going to sit here and lie and act like I'm like the best human being on the planet. Uh, yeah. So that's what, you know, the difference between the ISFP and the INFP, they're always going to buckle down on what their morals say. You know, me, I'm like, ah, okay. It's funny because when, even when I'm watching movies and stuff, I love those guys who can make those cold decisions because it's like, all right, kill one. Like, uh, INFP or ISFP, I feel like, oh, we got to save this one person. I'm like, no, they're done. We got to save a thousand people. So we're going with this option over here. I've always liked that because it's like, it makes more sense. We get a hundred other people compared to one where someone's like, oh, even, but, and it's so crazy because even if it was somebody that was close to me, I still would be like, sorry, you got to go. It's the betterment for the better path for everybody else. So it, um, I've, I've always liked characters like that um, where they can just go past it, but it, it, but they still feel it like, man, you know, we, would have hoped we could have got that one person there, but if not, well, so be it. That's it. So, yeah. So what I'm hearing is a utilitarian mindset, and so the greatest good for the greatest amount of people, the best move on the board is what Mercer calls it. And so, Dion, you would really like Thanos from the Marvel comic universe because he kills his own daughter to save half of the population. So he's like, you know what? For the greater vision, I'm gonna just kill this one person for the greater success of most people. So <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, that's that. I did, Thanos, what, it's funny you say that, me and my, my, uh, me and my friend were talking about that and I was like, I, I agree with Thanos. I like what Thanos did, even though, because um, you, I, it's, it's more so the objective thinking side of it, right? Um, it's more so the objective side of thinking things. Like even like people like uh, Leonidas from 300, love that guy because he was just like he didn't want to particularly have to sacrifice a lot of the men that he wanted to sacrifice but he did it for 
the vision that they had. So yeah, Thanos was definitely someone I liked as well. Interesting. And so Lawrence, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, well, I thought Mercer actually articulated my my, my points I was going to say better than I would. Um, uh, and also just kind of having a utilitarian mindset towards things. Uh, the only incremental thing I, I, I would add is that I know we've discussed like um, uh, impatience, handling emotions and stuff like that. I actually like like using kind of like ENTJ frameworks to try to get around that. So like an example of like how to get around impatience would be uh, even just sending myself Google Calendar invites like four or five, six hours in advance, maybe a couple of days in advance when a task is due just to remind uh just to, to follow up with different people on different tasks if i'm delegating it so um i think I, I like to think of like oh you can use an entj uh attitude as an advantage to kind of uh, mask some of the uh negative externalities that come with having an entj personality i do that as well and make a, rem a lot of reminders for myself and i didn't want to add too to what mercer and dion were saying I think there's a level for me. I'm also an Enneagram 8. I don't know if this is related also to this. I figure probably most of us are. And I have a fortress, and that's extremely important to me. And even when I was single, I feel like I'm building my own fortress. And that can come across as cold, maybe, and ruthless. But as to point out to what Dion said, too, that's if I don't feel like the other person's really going to receive what I have to say about my emotions, I think that's when I pull back and they, they don't see that side of me. And that's my natural reaction as a protection, as self-preservation. <clears throat> and even now I will do everything in my power to help my fortress to be more successful and protected. So I don't know if I'm fully in alignment with what you guys were talking about, about the util utilitarian, or if that's something similar. Uh, I, I first and foremost want the people in my fortress to be protected and strong and successful. I had a genuine question, um, I guess, for the group. So I guess we're talking about utilitarianism. We're talking about being very goals oriented uh, as the NTJs. Um, I guess this this conversation's been like an hour and a half. Like I, I was wondering, like what what was everyone's goals in kind of joining uh, this conversation? Um, I, I was curious, like what what brought people um, onto this? Um, Joyce uh, did an interview for us in um, Mongolia Mindset, so um, it's kind of uh, a payback for her, you know. Uh, and she does a good job, and why not? that simple. Uh, I think a good question, Joyce, you should have asked is what is SI trickster to ENTJs and really tap into their memory because ENTJs have the worst memory. We have the worst memory. I don't know how much stuff I forget all the time at all the time. Like if I don't have it attached to me, I will forget it. I almost forgot this meeting. Oh, man. Well, well to, to answer Lauren's question first, um, to go, I, I've been involved with MBTI for a few years now. Um, coming to here for Joyce is always support for Joyce, always. Uh, like I said, I'm very big into helping people build their brands and businesses, but I love Joyce. So, you know, she's, um, I like talking, you know, she typed me. I kept, I for the love of me, thought I was INTJ for the long time. Like, nope, you're clear cut INTJ. <laughs> but I'm um, coming here, I just wanted to, uh, the stereotypes just to see if it was some, I mean, we ended up all saying the same exact stuff. So the stereotype here to be true and some stuff, but I don't think, is ENTJ as far as the stereotype goes, were all the uh, it's all the exact same. I think that's just kind of redundant to say that all ENTJs are alike or the same. So my goal is to try to figure out if I'm hearing from different people's perspectives, would they be given a different perspective on maybe on how to grow as ENTJ, or just hearing um, you know something that may help me improve, which it does help me improve. But for the most part, it's the same old ENTJ stuff. So, uh, but like Mercer said, um. Being a SI, oh, it's it's funny. I and this is I think that's why I don't care much for tradition. Like, oh, we should eat at a table together. We should, you know, when you go on a date, it should be a picnic. Like, no, like let's get outside the bunch. Let's get creative. So, uh, and just having that memory, like I always forget my friends' anniversary dates. I feel bad, then I come back like, oh, I feel bad, and then I do it again the next year. Like, <laughs> all right. 
So memory is not a thing. <laughs> so he's absolutely right. Like I used to think FE was a trickster, but I'm like, no, it's definitely SI. And uh, a friend sent me a different test that was like a long, detailed one to see if I really was an ETJ. The results came back the same, but the weakest function I had was SI. So yeah, that that tricky little SI. And so, anyone else want to share why they're here? I'm I'm curious. <laughs> I, I appreciate the compliment. I mean, coming out for me, I appreciate it. You're there for me. Yeah, you're supporting my TE goals. This is the ENTJ love language. They support your goals because <laughs> they care about goals. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Um, uh, I guess the primary reason was uh, kind of supporting your channel. I think you're doing a really cool thing here. Um, and then I guess in my own self-interest, uh, I'm kind of stuck in the San Francisco tech tech bubble. I meet a lot of people who are very similar to me. And so uh, I, I saw this as an opportunity to get to connect and learn from other people uh, who might not have a similar background to me. So um, yeah. I'm also building my online network and I figured this is a win-win like you were talking about Joyce <laughs> for everybody and our scaling my online network. I think that what you're doing here in all of the MBTI type areas. I saw you had a few about INTJ, which I was going to share with the people I live with about emotions, because that was something that came up recently uh, in, in similar with ENTJs and emotions like we're talking about today. I think there's a lot of misunderstandings when related to ENTJ. So anytime I can add to the conversation to help people to understand us more and how we really function and operate in the world, I'm here for it. Correct those misunderstandings. That's what I love having people here for. Yeah. And Jivon, what brought you here today? You're, you're just being kind and accepting my invitation. Yeah, I'm here to understand how other e ENTJs think and behave. Seems like uh, we are all more or less the same. And given an opportunity, I would love to meet all of you in person, probably sometime. So I felt I'm talking to myself most of the cases because whatever uh, you know you guys shared, I could relate to it because because I was also I am also going through one of those things. So thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Yeah, well, thank you for being on. Oh, this is so mm -hmm. warm, fuzzy. You know, we talked about goals, and that's the way that you can get to an ENTJ's feelings. They're like, I'm proud of us. Yeah, that's awesome. And that is a wonderful way to end off this chat. Yeah, we'll see you all in the next video. So take care, everyone. Bye.